If, uh, good morning, everyone. If everyone could uh, work their way to their seat, we'll kind of ho- go ahead and kick off with a, a welcome to all of you to uh, f- be here for the OSHA seminar. Uh, my name is Joel Karsten. I'm a broker as well as sit on our board of directors here at the Crane Agency. And on behalf of uh, all 270 of us at Crane, we just want to welcome you and thank you for your business. Um, Since 1885, the Crane Agency has been around, and it's more than just selling insurance, and that's what today is all about, is all the additional services that we have. Yes, you have your broker and and the broker's team that does the day-to-day interactions with you as the business owners and support, but today is what differentiates ourselves in the marketplace, bringing these additional services that we have built into our agency. Um, In a minute, I'll have Don Hennon, our Director of Loss Control and um, Claims, introduce our speaker today, Lance, but a little bit of the resource that Don brings and his team. Don had over 25 years of experience at the Travelers Agency in their claims department. So when we get into these situations where our insurance carrier and you are not quite getting handled the right way in a claim scenario, Don is a huge asset for us that we have on staff, and uh, we're excited that, that he is uh, bringing our speaker today. So this morning I woke up, a little cold, right? A little dreary, and I thought, what a perfect day to talk about OSHA. <laughs> and what you'll see from our speaker today, uh, Lance Witcher, is is every stereotype of, a, of an attorney, experienced, knowledgeable, but he breaks all other stereotypes with his sense of humor. So I think <laughs> that you're gonna have a great hour and a half. Uh, as you can tell, the food is being served, um, and we'll get, get our program on the way. Here's Don. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Joel. Uh, my name is Don Hennon. I'm the Director of Risk, Risk Management and Claims at Crane, uh, and welcome to the seminar today. Can you hear me? I'm not hearing it. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, We have a lot of new people here today. Uh, So I kind of want to talk about our seminars. We do a seminar once in the spring and once in the fall. Uh, Usually they're claim-related topics. Uh, This one's on OSHA. Uh, It's really a little bit more of a loss control topic as far as I'm concerned, but a little bit of claim. Uh, And we actually had this as a recommendation by a prior attendee uh, with one of the surveys that we've received. And just by the way, speaking of surveys, there's surveys on your tables. We'd uh, really appreciate feedback that you can give us on our our, our, uh, seminar today. Um, So please, uh, you know, fill that out when you're done and just leave it on your tables. Uh, There's a couple questions about uh, topics, or at least one question about topics. We're always looking for topics. So if you have a topic for us to talk about, we're always looking for topics uh, for the next seminar. Uh, This is our first lunch seminar, so maybe people like the lunches as opposed to breakfasts. So that's also a question uh, on our questionnaire. Um, Today we're going to go through a lot of information. Uh, there's going to be information about whistleblower complaints, uh, informal complaints, and just really your rights under the OSHA Act, among other things. Uh, but before we get started, I do want to introduce two new loss control reps that we just hired at Crane. We have Brandon Putz. Uh, he's got about 10 years loss control uh, and engineering experience. He comes by way of Hortica Insurance and Van Liner Insurance. And we also have Kevin Hoffman. Uh, He's got 20 plus years loss control safety engineering experience. He's worked in the general industry for uh, for, um, businesses and also for uh, different brokers in town and most recently with Brick Street Insurance. Uh, He worked there for about a year or so. So we're really happy to have those guys join our our family. Um, As many of you know, we provided loss control services for our customer for many years and we've run across all sorts of different situations. And we've got a couple of photos of situations that if you actually see happen in your operations, you're gonna wanna call Crane or Lance immediately. So the first one is this one here. They've got good intentions here, but um, didn't really go about it the right way, I don't think. Think safety first, and he's stepping on some, I don't know if you can see a little ledge here. That's what he was trying to say. It wasn't really safe. So next one. Oh, that's my thing, yeah. Got it? Yep. 
Here's the next one. The guy's standing in front of a flammable gas situation with a cigarette in his mouth. I don't know if you can see a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. This is a before picture. Good thing it wasn't an after picture. So next one. Oh, next one. Sorry. And this is the final one. It's like Dumb and Dumber here, I think. A guy cutting, I don't know if you can see it, there's a guy with a circular saw on the guy's back cutting a piece of wood. So if you see those situations, you need to call Crane or Lance. Uh, Lance is our speaker today. Uh, he comes from one of our attorney partners that we've uh, utilized in the past called Ogletree Dakins. Uh, they're a large international full service law firm where Lance is a shareholder. Lance is licensed in Missouri and Illinois and has uh, litigated cases uh, in the U.S. District Courts all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. He's represented many employers in employment-related litigation in both the state and federal levels, and he regularly litigates against the EEOC and the U.S. Department of Labor. Uh, he also regularly provides HR consulting to avoid or reduce risk associated with employment-related litigation. So please welcome our guest speaker, Lance Witcher. Thank you, Don. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for having me here. Uh, let me start with, since thank you, Don, and thank you, Joel, for the great introduction. Let me start with humor, since Joel set me up, that I've got to at least be somewhat funny. Uh, hopefully, I'll not have any more of that feedback. Can everybody hear me OK? Good. Start with a little bit of Halloween humor, uh, since we're in October. A Halloween group therapy where the vampire says, my life bites. The ghost says, I'm not the man I used to be. The jack-o'-lantern says, I feel hollow inside. The, the nurse, I, excuse me, the witch, I curse everything. The ghoul, I haven't felt alive in years. Uh, and the head, I just feel disconnected. Hopefully, uh, you're not going to feel like that today. But if you've been through an OSHA inspection, uh, there's a chance you may have felt like that. Uh, no group therapy here today. And it's hard to make OSHA uh, entertaining. It's hard to make it funny. Um, I mean, by examples, I'm currently representing a manufacturing client who has no more than 42 employees, but got 32 serious citations, a repeat citation, and four other than serious citations for over $200,000. And it's a business that operates on just a line of credit. Um, uh, I've, I've been fortunate enough working with a great broker like Crane that they've had me represent um, businesses like yours, and including a roofing contractor who did everything right. Um, but unfortunately, an employee they hired uh, had a drinking problem, was diabetic, um, was working out on a hot roof. Uh, and because he drank about a handle of vodka every two days and wasn't taking his diabetes medicine, he fell prey to heat stress and passed away. OSHA issues a nasty press release, says they're an awful employer that kills their employees. And when Crane referred that client to me, they said, we're taking this case to trial unless OSHA backs off. And fortunately, um, once we got into litigation, OSHA backed off. So it's hard to make this too funny. So I thought I'd start with a cartoon, since uh, as we go through this, we know it's a very serious topic. It's a very serious topic to your business. You're fortunate um, that Crane offers services to you, value-added services for you. Uh, in that they'll help you with safety program development, they'll help you with OSHA compliance, they'll help even help you with training your managers on safety training and, and help you with safety and health audits. So those are all great resources to take advantage of. I hope for your sake you wouldn't need uh, our services that much, that you don't have that many OSHA-related matters or employment-related lawsuits. But if you'd just give me 15 seconds to make a shameless pitch. Uh, as Don said, we are an international labor and employment law firm. We've got 875 management side lawyers in our 55 offices worldwide. So if it's wage and hour compliance, if it's wrongful discharge cases, harassment cases, that's the type of stuff we do for businesses like yours. We represent half of the Fortune 100 companies. Here in St. Louis, we've got 25 lawyers, probably represent all of the brand names, Anheuser-Busch, BJC, Mercy, Amron, just in Boeing, just to name a few. But I represent an after-school program in Granite City, a battered woman's shelter in Joplin, Missouri. So we represent big and small clients. There are probably 30 to 40 of us that do safety and health work as well. And in fact, we're doing our national safety symposium October 25th through 27th in Dallas, where we have 100 clients that come in for this type of program over the course of several days. 
But if you're in the construction industry, I mean, we represent the bigs, Turner Construction, J.E. Dunn, those names, but we represent small roofing contract. And thanks to Crane for um, connecting small roofing contractor in mid-Missouri, other small um, subcontractors. So if you ever need help, uh, whether it's in the construction side, the manufacturing side, or anywhere else in the safety and health realm, or any other uh, management side, labor and employment services, we're happy to help. Uh, in addition to the free advice today through this presentation, though, I, hopefully each of you got one of these when you came in or on your table. I wanted to give you OSHA inspection guidelines. It wasn't um, by happenstance that I put my contact information on the front page, because if you do need a lawyer, this is what I do, uh, and I'm happy to help. But whether you need uh, a lawyer or not, um, I gave you a deep dive into your rights as business owners, your rights as employers when you're involved in an OSHA inspection, because OSHA is not going to tell you what those rights are. OSHA is a federal regulator who is tasked with writing citations, citations that could be upwards of $12,000 to $126,000 each. And OSHA is also tasked with notifying the FBI if we as employers provide any false information to them, because the FBI can inspect that uh, and can turn us over to the US DOJ for prosecution. So OSHA is very much a policing authority. I'm not saying they're bad. Um, there's a lot of good that OSHA does, and we'll talk about some of the good they do through safety and health regulations. Police officers, I don't think, are bad. That doesn't mean we necessarily tell them everything about us if we're pulled over. If we get pulled over for speeding, we don't say, yeah, and I've got an unregistered handgun in the glove compartment, uh, some pot in the side thing, and, and some bourbon in my trunk. So I don't want any of this to sound like I'm, I'm bashing on OSHA. But their job is citing us as employers and, and through significant citations, convincing us and other employers to change their ways. And I don't represent OSHA. I represent you and businesses like you. So my goal is to help contain that potential liability and make sure you understand your rights as a business owner, even when you're being investigated by OSHA, because they're not going to tell you what those are. But if we don't get, it, get through all of it, uh, that handy desk reference is, is ensured to give you a deeper dive there. Uh, so our agenda is talking about, I'm going to just come up in front of this podium if that's all right with you. But our agenda is talking about uh, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration themselves. We'll talk about your rights with OSHA inspections and your obligations, uh, how uh, to respond to informal OSHA complaints, uh, and we'll talk a bit about whistleblower complaints. We've got many employers, all of which are covered by various sorts of rules for safety. Uh, depending upon your business, you can get online on OSHA's website and figure out what are the top 20 citations businesses in your SIC code face from OSHA. And that's a really good place, as, as, as the Crane folks, uh, loss control specialists would tell you, that's a really great starting point for you on doing your own audits. But whether we're talking about personal protective equipment, forklift safety, fire extinguishers, fall protection, respirator use, carcinogen exposure, uh, the list goes on and on what OSHA regulates. Uh, the act itself was passed in 1970, giving OSHA the authority to promulgate regulations that make it clear to employers, in some cases not quite as clear, but designed to make it clear to employers what their obligations are to provide a safe and healthy workplace to their employees. And they do that for most of you in this room under 1910, uh, 29 CFR 1910, which are the regulations that apply to general industry employers for those of you who are construction employers, primarily under 1926. Uh, in addition to OSHA's regulations that they promulgate, there's also a general duty clause, a very vague general duty clause in the act. So even when OSHA hasn't promulgated a regulation that tells you as an employer what you have to do to comply with the law, they can seek a citation against you, uh, issue a citation against you um, for violating the general duty clause because of hazards that you knew or should have known or that your industry knows or should know about and failing to correct those hazards. So even if there's not a regulation on point, there's still avenues for OSHA to address that. 
As you all know, unless you're one of the exempt industries from providing or from preparing uh, injury and illness records, and the exempt industries, there's a list on OSHA's record keeping website. You'll see that website here shortly. But generally, retail companies uh, and office-based uh, companies are generally exempt from the injury and illness records. But absent you falling in one of those exemptions, every year you have to keep an OSHA 300 log. Uh, you'll have to fill out a 300A summary of your injuries and illnesses. And for each injury and illness, you have to keep a 301 or an equivalent record that would contain the same information that you might get through your work comp carrier. Uh, if you have a death, one or more lost work days, uh, work restrictions so they can't do all of their duties, loss of consciousness, transfer to another job because they can't perform their current job with their restrictions, they need medical treatment beyond first aid, or there are significant injuries or illnesses that are diagnosed and treated by a medical professional, all of those would have to be um, kept in your injury and illness logs. As I said, uh, here is OSHA's record keeping page. On OSHA's record keeping page, this is a very handy resource, yes. Do you want questions an hour or you want to wait till the end? Uh, fire away. All right, go back to the previous slide. Yes, sir. Please. It says medical treatment beyond first aid. Yes. Uh, can we define first aid as just on premise first aid, going to an urgent care center? Would it be considered first aid? Or is going to an urgent care center beyond first aid? That is a perfect setup for this page right here, and I'll answer that question. That's fantastic. In fact, I'm going to advance one page, and you could see here that this is OSHA's record keeping page. And each of these uh, regulations, so here we're talking about general recording criteria, so my friend from Sentinel um, is hitting on it. You click here, you could read the regulation, it's going to tell you specifically what first aid means. You could click here for additional guidance. Um, and there are two other resources that typically only lawyers use, but if you really wanted to dig into it because you're questioning whether this employee had more than first aid, whether it's first aid treatment for us or it's first aid treatment at an urgent care. Um, but first aid treatment would mean the sort of thing you'd expect to get out of a first aid kit. And anything beyond that would be medical treatment. Now the difficulty can be, and we're gonna talk about this just in a moment when we get into injuries that you have to report to OSHA within eight hours or 24 hours. That could be a lot more challenging because urgent care is not necessarily going to tell you what treatment that they're giving that particular employee. And so you have to strike that balance about, well, how could we get additional information and potentially meet the eight hour reporting requirement or the 24 hour reporting requirement, or do we wait until we have that information, be diligent about it by talking with our work comp carrier to see if we could get more information about that. But some employers will wait, and some employers end up getting a citation because they waited, and they have to fight those citations, and we help with that. Um, some employers will take the approach that it's probably gonna be medical care. I mean, it looked like a significant enough injury that I don't need to hear from them that they're gonna have to treat this person. Let's call it in in eight hours. Uh, if if it's an amputation. We're gonna talk about that in just a moment. I'm not suggesting just because you've got a cut, you'd have to call OSHA for that, but we'll talk about that just in a moment. But great question. And OSHA's record keeping page uh, would be something put on your um, favorites um, because you can get a lot of that information without having to pay legal counsel um, to get that. But I know Crane is happy to help answer those questions as well. Let me quickly talk about, again, we're still just talking about re uh, recording injuries as opposed to reporting injuries to OSHA. Um, so as employers, we've always had to, unless we're exempt, record injuries since 1970. But we would have those records on site, and we'd only have to make those available to OSHA during an OSHA inspection when they'd ask for them. And when we get into inspections, you'll see that that's something you have to readily make available to OSHA because you're legally required, unless you're exempt, to keep your injury and illness records. You may know that last year, under the prior administration, there was going to be electronic filing of those records. And there may still be under this administration. This administration's having a few problems trying to figure out certain things. Um, and so we'll see how this goes. But the idea under the prior administration was they were gonna use this as a means to shame employers 
because employers have to put online where their customers, uh, vendors, or other business affiliates could see, or worse, for those of you that are in a union environment, your injury and illness records that the union could then use, or if you're being sued for products liability or per personal injury, that information would be available publicly. This administration delayed the electronic filing of records until December 1. They might kick it even more um, because they're still debating on how they're going to implement this. So I'd say stay tuned. Um, I'm sure Crane will keep you updated. We too, and you've got my contact info, you could send me an email and I'll sign you up for it. But we push safety and health bulletins out weekly, certainly at least monthly, to our, for, to our friends and clients. And we'll be keeping our clients updated on that and we're happy to do so for you. So stay tuned. Um, but as it stands right now, they're saying starting in 2019, injury and illness reports will be due on March 2nd of each year again. Um, let's wait to see and not spend a lot of time talking about that. You may know that OSHA did get its injury tracking application system up. Even when they announced this rule, they didn't have a place where you could electronically file your injury and illness reports. They now have that online. Please do not file your injury and illness reports. You're not required to, just as you're not required to open your glove compartment or trunk, um, to use that example before. Don't file them until we know for sure whether they're going to require that. Uh, and whether you are required, because as a business with over 250 employees, there you'll have to file all of your injury and illness records, but less than 250 employees, fewer of the injury and illness records. But again, let's wait and see what the ultimate rule is going to be. Uh, just quickly, for those of you that have operations outside of Missouri and Illinois, if you have them in Iowa, uh, there are 20 um, states, uh, California, there, there are 20 states that are not regulated by the federal OSHA, but instead are, are state plan states. So just keep in mind that if you're operating outside of 30 or so states, that um, there are plan states. This was allowed by uh, the Occupational Safety and Health Act when it was passed in 1970, and they said if states want to require more of employers, they're fine with it, at least as, so long as they require at least as much as OSHA requires. Most of those state plans still follow the federal regulations, but their procedures might be different. And I said 20 states, 21 states, uh, and D.C. Uh, so with that, let's talk about uh, inspections. And again, we will get into the reporting of injuries when we're talking about uh, uh, OSHA inspections here. Uh, you might ask, why am I being inspected? Uh, the enforcement agencies themselves are inherently political, uh, and they look at statistics, past inspections, and past citations to drive future enforcement. So when they're looking at, so, so OSHA has, and we'll talk about this some here today, targeted inspection programs where they will pick industries that maybe politically, these are industries um, that need to be regulated more heavily. Coal mining should be no surprise, um, and plenty of talk about that, and now plenty of talk uh, about this administration saving coal mining because they're going to roll back regulations. But that's an example of one of those industries that politically became more heavily regulated, and not for the wrong reasons. Coal miners truly are putting uh, their lives at risk um, when, they're, when they're underground mining coal. But they'll also look at industries, uh, statistics, uh, and, and, and how likely or how many injuries they have as compared to other industries as a whole when they're determining targeted inspection programs on a national, regional, or local level. And those are businesses that can randomly be selected because of particular risks that they face. So no surprise, construction industry is going to be in various targeted inspection programs for slips and falls, fall protection, um, PPE. Similarly, manufacturing and warehousing clients will be covered by a regional and a local emphasis program for forklifts and injuries from material handling equipment. So when you say, why me, there is the chance that you, because of the industry that you're in, could be randomly selected for an inspection. But of course, as I'm sure you know, uh, you can also be inspected because of a complaint by an employee. Uh, this is just, uh, I, I'll just stay on track for time, um, just uh, a look at the injuries uh, and rate of fatalities by industries. Those industries uh, that have a higher rate of fatalities, no doubt, 
will be uh, in targeted inspection programs. So let's talk about the employer conduct that triggers an OSHA inspection. OSHA focuses on the relationship between employers and employees, and there are three types of liabilities that employers could have uh, for OSHA citations. The first of which would be the obvious, and that is the employer is creating the hazard for the employee. Uh, that could be, if we're talking about a multi-employer worksite, take construction, for example. Uh, you've got one sub that's out there and 20 other, seven, or 20 other subs and a general contractor that's out there. That sub could be the creating employer for any employee that's exposed, whether they're employed by that sub or not, because they've created the hazard. Similarly, with exposing, you could be multiple employers that are exposing employers, employees to that hazard. So just being one of those employers that's on that job site and not recognizing the hazard that that sub is creating, but allowing your employees to be subjected to that hazard and not doing anything about it could subject you to liability there. And controlling is the third basis. If you're the general on the job or you've got subs working for you, you could be the controlling employer in that particular instance. For most of us that aren't in the construction realm, our liability would be just as, a, as an employer who's either creating or exposing our employees to a particular hazard. Agency triggers um, for inspections, certainly high visibility incidents. OSHA has police scanners uh, and ambulance scanners and fire scanners. So OSHA is listening to those scanners uh, all day long and into the evening. And when there is a fatality or some other catastrophe, OSHA will dispatch compliance officers either that night or absolutely the very next day. So keep that in mind. That is what's called a referral by OSHA, and they're permitted, well, we'll talk about whether they're permitted. We're per, they're permitted to conduct that inspection if we or the owner of the site consents, uh, or if we deny consent, if they get a search warrant. But we'll get into that. Um, but that could trigger uh, uh, an, an, an OSHA inspection. And similarly, where there have been ugly past inspections, OSHA is much more likely to want to inspect a, an employer to make sure that they've abated those conditions. Um, complaints by employees, complaints by the labor unions when they're in contract negotiations with the employer and they want to ramp up a little bit of leverage on the employer, um, or press reports um, can lead to an inspection. Uh, maybe less so under uh, a Republican administration, though some argue that this is not necessarily a Republican administration, uh, or at least a Republican <laughs> president. Um, but uh, under prior administrations, concern about whether employers getting compliance assistance from OSHA could lead to OSHA conducting inspections of those uh, employers, which is why we typically recommend that you get assistance from either your broker, your insurer, or at most the state uh, agencies, not the state plan states for OSHA compliance because they're an enforcement arm, but Missouri uh, Department of Labor has consultants that they can dispatch at your request to look at uh, issues. But you're much safer having your broker uh, and your insurer or working with your legal counsel because then you can protect it by attorney-client privilege um, to, to do your audits and your evaluation. We talked about targeted inspection programs, and that's the reference to the special emphasis there, that depending upon your industry uh, or depending upon your injury and illness rates, if they're above average um, compared to all industries as a whole, you could be in a special emphasis program. So let's talk about the big picture with citations. No surprise that citations are disfavored uh, for us as employers because we don't like the idea of having to pay out upwards of 12,000 for a serious citation or 126,000 for a willful citation. And willful citations are of course a lot less frequent. Um, but there's other reasons that citations themselves are disfavored and have significance. And that is that admitting to those citations, they could end up uh, as evidence for civil lawsuits or criminal prosecutions. So you've got an employee injury that's going to be in the work comp realm, uh, and their counsel is interested in any admissions you might make 
through OSHA. I'll tell you, in the work comp realm, that's not as big of a deal because in the work comp realm, unless they were using drugs or they, it was the employee themselves that engaged in all of the negligence, we're on the hook. That's the way the system is set up for us in the work comp realm. But there is the possibility that if it was a vendor or other third party who's on our work site, you've got to think about accepting that citation. You're admitting to a violation of federal law, safety and health law, that could be used in evidence um, for those. Absolutely to the extent that, uh, and I pray it, and I mean that, I pray it never happens to you, but to the extent that you have a fatality or a catastrophe and you've got prior citations that show that you let things go that are at issue with that fatality or that catastrophe, it could be used as evidence in criminal prosecutions or civil cases for that nature. So when, as an employer, if we get citations, it is worth talking to a loss control specialist with Crane, talking to me or other safety and health lawyers that do this to think about what are the long-term implications if we accept these citations. And we're gonna talk about your rights and avenues that you have to potentially get those citations modified in a way that makes sense for your business. Um, and and um, maybe then you resolve that potential litigation. Uh, OSHA regulations require that employers notify OSHA as follows. So we talked about, we said we'd talk about the reporting of injuries. Uh, as of January 1, 2015, employers are now required to report all uh, work-related fatalities within eight hours and all inpatient hospitalizations, amputations, and losses of an eye within 24 hours. You'll recall that prior to January 1, 2015, we'd only have to report a hospitalization of three or more employees. Now we have to report a single inpatient hospitalization. We're not talking about an employee that goes to the hospital and is released that same day. We'd be talking about an employee that's gonna stay in that hospital overnight. So back to your example from Sentinel, if they're going to urgent care, it's not going to be a reportable instance. It'll still be recordable in our injury and illness logs if it's more than first aid, but it won't be reportable unless they went to urgent care for an amputation. And you might think an amputation, if they just lose a fingernail or just a tiny, tiny part of their finger, it's not an amputation, it's an avulsion. I would say have a discussion with your broker, your loss control specialist with Crane, or have a discussion with your legal counsel about whether OSHA is going to look at that as an avulsion or an amputation. Because the reality is you may save yourself several thousand dollars just reporting an injury that OSHA may not even inspect anyways. But again, um, that you'd want to look at each of those uh, on a case by case basis. All right, so let's talk about OSHA inspections. Uh, this guy can do that much easier than I can. Uh, you'd think I could do it well with a low center of gravity. Um, so what we're, gonna, what we're gonna talk about is how cooperative we ought to be um, during an OSHA inspection uh, or uh, whether we want to, in various instances, preserve our rights. Um, most employers who haven't been through many OSHA inspections will think that if I'm just forthcoming and I open up to OSHA and I give, their, they tell me they're here to help. They literally do, uh, oftentimes at the start of an inspection, say, I'm here to help. Um, Maybe it's not the best analogy, but when you get pulled over for speeding, the police officer's not there to help. You're not changing your tire. You're pulled over because you broke the law. And if OSHA's there, they're there because either you're in an industry that has uh, an emphasis program that's randomly selected you because you're likely to have those hazards in your workplace. And even the best of intentioned employers who work with their brokers and insurers and pay consultants to come in and evaluate will have things that aren't in compliance with the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Or if it's a complaint, it might be just a disgruntled former employee who just wants to make life hard on you, or a labor union that's in negotiations and they want you to give that extra quarter a year increase, and maybe if we start calling these administrative agencies, you'll cave and start giving them what they want. But even if that's the case, there's still a chance that what's being complained about is a hazard that could lead to a citation. And importantly for OSHA, if there is any citation that is in plain view while they're conducting inspection, they're legally required to issue a citation. So even if the underlying complaint is bogus, 
but they're walking by extension cords that are being used instead of when permanent wiring is required, or a knockout plate is missing from an electrical box or a cover plate, uh, whatever it is. Or you've got some of these examples that Don and Joel used of employees that are just doing stupid <laughs> things while they're hanging the safety first sign. Um, that's going to happen, and so you have to make a decision about whether you'd be cooperative or you'd preserve your rights, because OSHA, as I said, uh, OSHA has an obligation to issue citations when they see violations of the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Some compliance officers might turn a blind eye to them if you really, really butter them up, but most will not, um, and buttering up I'm not saying you, you will be friendly, you'll be professional with OSHA, but you've got to, be a, uh, got to make a decision about how much you're willing to share with OSHA. So a starting point, should I let OSHA in? Uh, as I alluded to before, OSHA can't inspect, even if, as I said, they get that police scanner call, they know that um, an ambulance was dispatched to take an employee to the hospital, and let's say, you know, we're not sure if the employee is really going to be admitted overnight, and we don't find out within eight hours, so we haven't reported that. OSHA's already heard about it, and OSHA can come out and present its credentials and ask to inspect our workplace. That doesn't mean OSHA has a right to inspect our workplace. Whether we own the property or we lease the property, we've got rights as a lessor and, and or as an owner. So we have the right to consent to the inspection, consent to a limited inspection. Uh, we could foolishly waive that right and let OSHA inspect anything OSHA wants, but we ought not to. Absent that, Absent our consent to come into our workplace and conduct some inspection, depending upon how the scope will be negotiated, then OSHA has to go to a federal court and get a search warrant. And that is our constitutional right under the Fourth Amendment to require a search warrant. I don't typically recommend it. It depends upon how I get a feel for the compliance officer, why they're there, and how broad of an inspection they want to go. But it's important for each of us to know, as employers, as property owners, or lessors, that we don't have to let OSHA come into our door. The only thing we've got to give OSHA are injury and illness logs if we're not exempt. And there are some other limited things that OSHA is entitled to because their regulations require we do it. But outside of that, it's up to us whether we consent to allow them to come in. And I'm making that point so that you'll understand you have more leverage than you may currently realize or may have realized before I made that point. You have more leverage about how you're going to, how we're going to classify the scope of that inspection. So OSHA's there because an employee made a complaint about not using fall protection when somebody was hanging uh, the safety first sign, um, or two other knuckleheads were standing, one was standing on the other one's back while he was doing work, and that third knucklehead was smoking the cigarette uh, by the propane or gasoline tanks. Well, if those are the complaints, then yeah, we'll consent to your inspection of those issues. Uh, hopefully, we found we caught those, and we could say, you know, those employees don't work here anymore, or at least their wings were clipped very hard, and they're being watched closely. But we'd say those are valid issues for you to inspect. If you want to look at what they were using for fall protection when they hung that sign, or the area where they were smoking that cigarette while they were by the propane tank, or you'll have to go somewhere else to find those two knuckleheads that were doing what they were doing, um, but we'll give you their contact info. That's within the scope of the inspection. And we'll give you our injury and illness records. And because maybe the latter one's a fall protection, we'll share with you our fall protection program. Um, we want you to know what we're doing with regard to fall protection. That's reasonably related to this complaint that some employee saw about that. Uh, maybe for the smoking incident. We'll share with you our training records about how people know that they're not supposed to do that. We're a smoke-free campus. Here it is. Um, we'll share with you the disciplinary records that show that we monitor for compliance with that. We're good with that. But that doesn't mean you get to inspect our equipment, our electrical stuff, our hazard communication program, um, employee exposure to airborne, tox airborne substances. So, because we have the right to consent 
to that inspection or require them to get a search warrant. Because if they go to federal court and they've got to get their lawyers to travel, if you're on this side of the Mississippi, to travel from Kansas City to go to federal court, if you're on the other side of the Mississippi, from Chicago typically, to go to federal court here in St. Louis to get that search warrant, and a federal judge typically is going to say, well, what was the complaint? What is it you want to accomplish? And then the federal judge is going to issue a search warrant that limits the scope of that inspection. If OSHA is there for a complaint, it doesn't mean OSHA gets to do a wall-to-wall -wall inspection of your facility unless you consent to that, and that's a really, really bad idea. If OSHA is there because of one of these emphasis programs, they can only, we only have to consent or send them to court to get a search warrant, which is our Fourth Amendment right. But at most, we only have to consent that they can inspect what's identified in that national, regional, or local emphasis program. So how this plays out, I'll just tell you how I do it. Um, and again, all of this is set forth in your materials. But all of my clients have my cell phone number. You've got my cell phone number. It's on page one of your handy desk reference. And client calls. Um, and if it's a client that's an OSHA client, I almost always pick up, even if I'm in a meeting, because if that's all they ever call me for, I know that's likely why they're calling me. But if I was in a meeting with another client, I might say, can I just make sure this is an emergency? And they say, an OSHA inspection, an OSHA inspector's here. I said, okay, why don't we put, why, why is he or she there? Um, they'll say, well, we had this complaint, or he says, he or she says they've got a complaint. I said, okay, why don't we put the inspector on the phone? I'll ask a few questions before that. Do you really want me there for this? Because uh, if you want me there, I can clear my calendar for tomorrow or early next week. Do you feel like you need me? Part of that's a decision based upon knowing if they have a professional on staff who can provide those services and, and knows what to look for. Or your broker, the wonderful crane agency, might have professionals who could help with that. But then I'll just get in a conversation with the compliance officer. And I don't piss them off because I know you're, you've got to win the battle and the war. Um, I mean, we'll, we might disagree and we'll talk about why there is an Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission for when we disagree with OSHA. But I don't have to get in their face on the phone. I just say, you know, what's bringing you here? What are you looking to inspect? Um, what are you going to need? Uh, and we talk through the scope of that inspection, and if they want me there, it might be as soon as I can get theirs tomorrow or early next week, they want me there. We'll get you our injury and illness records within three hours because that's what we're required to do. If the complaint relates to some other items that we're specifically required to maintain records of inspections for, if you've got mechanical drill presses in a manufacturing environment, you've got to keep periodic inspections. They're entitled to those reports pretty readily. So we'll say, we'll get you those records you know, within three hours. Um, but we're going to need to schedule the inspection for such and such day because my client wants me there. Or the client has facilities all over the country and they need their safety and risk person to fly in from another office. Absent you consenting to an inspection, it's going to take them every bit of three or four days, if not a full week, to get a search warrant from the federal court. Now it pisses them off, so I'm not suggesting you want to just say, go get a search warrant, because we don't want to piss them off. <laughs> But we can have a conversation with them, say, look, the soonest you're going to get out here anyway is going to be a week from now. And that's after you've taken one of your trial attorneys from Kansas City or Chicago to, to, to prepare the pleadings and to travel here to get a federal court order to come in. We're not saying you've got to do any of that. We're just saying the scope of the inspection ought to be related to this complaint or I will read the local emphasis program. I literally uh, had a conversation with an OSHA inspector while I was watching my kids' soccer game where I printed out in advance because we were still negotiating the scope of the inspection. He was slow to get back to me. Nice guy. Um, and I curried real favor with him when he inspected a prior client because he was having car trouble. And I said, let me do this. I'll follow you home. If you have car trouble, I can get you home. And so he and I are friends now. Um, but we were disagreeing about the scope of this inspection for this client, and they didn't hire me to make friends with an OSHA compliance officer, even though he's a really good guy. They hired me to protect their rights. And I said to him, I said, well, we'll give you this, this, and this. I mean, I was literally at St. Paul's de Pere um, watching out over the soccer field while I'm watching the game. I said, I'm looking at the local inspection program right here. I get it. You're entitled because there was a complaint. And this industry falls into material handling, that you get to inspect the material handling equipment, you get to inspect whether these shelves are, um, are, are firm, are, are, are affixed to the floor or to the wall. And we're fine with all that, but there was no 
lockout tag. There was no injury as a result of service to machinery, so you don't need their lockout tagout program. Um, there was no issue as to personal protective equipment. So we don't need to show you our hazard assessments and personal protective equipment because that wasn't related to this. So we worked through by phone what the scope of that inspection would be. I didn't have that problem with him, but I've had it with other compliance officers where they said, we'll just get a search warrant. I said, that's, that's fine. I said, you know, we'll, we'll, it's our right to invoke that. But when you go to a federal judge, that federal judge is going to say, what was the complaint? And what's, and or what was the national, regional, or local emphasis program you're inspecting under? So what is it out of this document that you get a look at? So I said, it's going to be the same result. And we're not going to make you do that. We're trying to work with you here, but it doesn't mean we're just going to open up our doors and let you look at everything. So I know I spent longer talking about that than maybe I should, um, but I just wanted to make the point that they have to then get a court order, and even that federal judge is going to limit the scope of their inspection. You should be limiting the scope of that inspection as an employer because you have that right. All right, I'll take a breath. Is there and, any judge A to Judge B that one was appointed by this guy, and one was appointed by a different Sure. Yeah, I, that, that's a fair question. I appreciate you asking that, Rick. Uh, absolutely, there are going to be judges that you know are more left-leaning or more right-leaning, and you could generally, by and large, um, make a generalization of that based upon when they were appointed. Um, but nevertheless, they still understand the idea of search warrants, whether they, whether they were appointed by President Obama or when President Trump gets around to more of them, President Trump. Um, they're going to be issuing search warrants in criminal matters. And so they understand the concept of reasonable suspicion. And they understand that OSHA can't just drop in on us and conduct an inspection because OSHA wants to. The only way OSHA could just drop in on us and conduct an inspection is if you've got work that's taking place outside of your four walls and they can see through a fence or from your parking lot some, uh, some violation of the Occupational Safety and Health Act. They can't just drop in on you. It doesn't work that way. They have to have reasonable suspicion, and that's why I tie it back to the police officer pulling you over. They can't just pull you over. They have to have some reasonable suspicion before they can. So those federal judges, regardless of whether they vote with a big D or a big R, still understand the concept of search warrants and reasonable suspicion and the Fourth Amendment protections. Great question. Appreciate that. All right. Let's just say, okay, let's talk about, let's say we've consented to the scope of, we, we've agreed to some scope of the inspection, or they've gotten a search warrant, and we're comfortable that what they're doing is going to be within the search warrant. And the question is, how do we treat inspections? You have to treat every inspection like it's litigation, because more often than not, citations are going to come from it. You might decide as an employer that I'm just going to accept some deal on those citations instead of taking it to litigation. But OSHA has six months to issue those citations, and you don't know how many citations they're going to issue. So what I'd say is they are a policing authority. You have to treat every inspection like it's potentially going to be into litigation so that you're best protecting your own sex. Um, OSHA, OSHA gathers all the information it needs to support the citation and to aid in the prosecution uh, of the case. When OSHA is doing an inspection, the OSHA compliance officers are trained professionals who know what they want to support a citation because that's what they do all day long. Uh, and they know how to get it oftentimes in very casual conversations while they're walking through our plant, our construction site, or our facility. I assume none of you have been trained as an OSHA compliance officer. I haven't been trained as an OSHA compliance officer. The only reason I know is because I see how they do it. And they just say, you know, this is off the record, or I'm here to help, just want to make sure I understand this. They know what they're looking for, and they know what they want to gather to use against you um, if, if and when they issue those citations. So treat every inspection like litigation. It is absolutely important to establish a cooperative relationship, but that doesn't mean we give them everything that they want. You can be cooperative without being a pushover and letting them do whatever it is they want. We've talked about determining the scope of the inspection. We talked about the fact that they've got to have a complaint or it's got to be in a targeted inspection program for them to be there. Um, or they have to see something from the fence or the parking lot to be there. If it's a complaint, 
ask OSHA for the complaint. They're not going to tell you who made the complaint. That person's entitled to have their identity protected, and OSHA's entitled never to tell you who that is because they don't want them retaliated against. But you're entitled to see the complaint. Uh, insist on an opening conference. Insist upon a conversation with the OSHA compliance officer about why or he, she is there, making sure that they've got their credentials. I've yet to see somebody uh, impersonate an OSHA officer, but they'll show you their credentials so you know that you've got a federal regulator that's in your facility. But insist upon that opening um, conference so you can talk through the scope of that inspection and how we're going to do it. Make a person a single point of contact and make sure that single point of contact who's going to be walking around with OSHA during the walk, walk around, during the inspection itself, isn't somebody who's got diarrhea of the mouth and is going to say whatever. You don't want somebody who's going to be, you know, with the OSHA inspector and they say, you know, you see that hazard over there? He's like, yeah, I've been telling my boss about that for months. We've never done anything about it. You don't want that person doing it. Or you don't want somebody to say, damn, we never should have done that, or I knew better, blah, blah, blah. You know, uh, we'll talk about how you might uh, answer those questions. Um, but pick somebody who's going to be prudent and who's going to be fairly uh, shrewd about what, if anything, he or she is going to offer OSHA. You know, if you've got a facility where you're beholden to a particular customer and you have to structure your manufacturing environment in a way that that customer wants, you may have trade secrets or may have other trade secrets because of chemicals and that. There's a way to protect that information so that if the union or somebody else were to make a FOIA request, freedom of information request for your file at a later date, those trade secrets wouldn't be turned over. So that's something to consider. Always, always, always uh, accompany the OSHA compliance officer. Um, maybe not walking into the men's room or ladies' room. Um, but otherwise, always accompany the OSHA compliance officer. And let's just talk about how you would get the OSHA compliance officer to the parts of the inspection that we've negotiated the scope of or that are covered by the search warrant. You can't blindfold a federal regulator, and you can't tie his or her hands. You can't restrain. You can restrain, but the FBI is going to show up uh, and do an inspection. So you're never going to lay your hands on an OSHA compliance officer. You need a better lawyer than me because I don't do criminal law. Um, but we don't have to take the OSHA compliance officer through the part of the plant that the OSHA compliance officer insists upon. Again, you're a property owner. You've got property rights or lesser rights. And so if the issue of the, stealing Don's cartoons again, if the issue, the think safety sign is probably not going to be in the back of the plant, so that doesn't work. So let's take the cigarette smoker by the gasoline tanks, and that's the back of the plant. If you've got a door to the back of the plant, you can say, yeah, take you right to it. Let's walk around the building. Or let's hop in my car or a golf cart, and we'll take you right back to it. We don't have to let the OSHA, because it's our consent, or the, even if with the search warrant, it doesn't give them the right to walk wherever they want to walk. So we can take them through the route to those particular hazards that are going to subject them to less things in plain view that might be a problem. So keep that in mind. You're always accompanying the OSHA compliance officer, and you could figure out a better path to get back there that is going to be less likely to have any citations. And there's nothing while you're doing that opening conference or having your legal counsel or loss control specialist help you negotiate the scope of that inspection. There's nothing that keeps you from having somebody else walk in the path once they know what that complaint is to make sure that we don't have sharp objects sticking out. We don't have employees who aren't wearing their safety glasses, who aren't wearing steel-toed boots, or whatever it might be. All right. Um, insist that all document requests be put in writing because you may want to review those with your legal counsel. But even if you don't review those with legal counsel, you want to make sure it's clear what OSHA is asking for. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to give them everything. But it's horrible when OSHA says, I want A, B, C, and D. We don't insist that they put it in writing. We give them A, B, C, and D. Or maybe we give them A, a B, and D. And they say, well, where's E and F? Well, E and F never, yes, we talked about that. Insist that OSHA put in writing what it is they're going to want. So are you saying they only get one bite at the apple? No, that's a great question, Rick. Um, OSHA has six months to issue citations, and OSHA could come back out. And just with your question, Rick, let's say OSHA's out there because of the complaint um, with the employee who's, let's do something easier. Any, any manufacturing clients in here or, or storage clients, forklifts? 
I mean, forklifts are the ones that we see so all too often with warehousing or manufacturing clients. And it's somebody who's saying, they were having me operating a forklift and I was never trained on it. Or the rubber pad's missing from the brake pedal, or it's leaking. It's hydraulics, hydraulics leak. Uh, but they say it's leaking. And that's those sorts of complaints, OSHA, we'll talk about OSHA's, in, if we have time, OSHA's informal complaint system, but those sorts of complaints, OSHA has to inspect. Well, if OSHA's out there inspecting those and they see a welder who's welding not wearing respiratory protection, they're gonna bring in a certified industrial hygienist when they come back the next time. I'm not just saying that because it was the next bullet. I'm literally saying it, Rick, because you raised it, and it's a good example. Um, they're gonna come back out because then they're going to see a hazard in plain view that they're gonna to wanna to have a CIH come out and do some air monitoring. So they can schedule their next visit. Now again, importantly, as I said, you're, they're only there by your consent. That consent can be withdrawn. If they overstep the inspection, or we don't like the way the things are going, or we think, well, no, we're not gonna just let you continue to expand this, we could say, we'd like to see you leave. You say it nice. But we'd say, you know, we want to have legal counsel here, or we want to insist upon a search warrant, or what have you. Um, but that consent can be withdrawn. Don't physically remove them, but you can say, you know, let's let's continue this another day. You'll be hearing from our counsel or whatever. All right. Um, if OSHA's taking pictures or video, you should be taking pictures or video because otherwise you're not going to get those records until you're in litigation. And we're going to talk about informal conferences, and you'd want to have information to challenge citations in informal conferences. You won't have that because OSHA doesn't share their file with you during the informal conference. Um, and we can insist that employee interviews be scheduled. Um, whoever's doing the walk around, and maybe it's two people, maybe one's doing the talking, but hopefully not a whole bunch of talking, uh, and somebody else is taking notes on all the details while they're going through that, and they're taking those notes for the purposes of talking about this with their legal counsel, who's either there or they'll be consulting because we want those notes to be privileged and not something that we turn over. That wasn't lost on anybody, right? Taking notes to talk with your lawyer or your insurer because there is an insurer insured privilege too but that would be the purpose of that person taking those notes because that way they're protected, uh, they're privileged uh, and don't have to be turned over um, to the government. Keep a record of the interviews, participate in interviews. If it's a management interview, and you'll see this on a later slide, but if it's a management interview, they absolutely have a right to be there. We as an employer absolutely have a right to be there. If it's an employee, we'll talk in just a moment about that the employee could request you. Uh, this is really a point about whoever's doing the walk around. You know, if, uh, if the guilt or negligence is obvious, um, our person doing the walk around should say, I'd rather not discuss it. Um, just, just avoid discussing fault, how long the conditions existed or whether anyone knew about it. We don't want to give OSHA that information. But, you know, they could emphasize, you know, we've got a safety program. We do inspections. We look for these sorts of things. Couldn't have been there long um, because we would have picked it up on it. We walk the floors daily. Um, you know, we're going to fix that right away and it'll never happen again. That's all fine. Just don't admit we knew about it or should have known about it for some period of time and didn't do anything about it. Make sense? Okay. Uh, the walk around itself, as I said, is essentially a management interview in and of itself. Even though it might seem casual and the inspector's not necessarily taking notes at the time, the inspector's remembering what's said to him or her during that inspection. So just walking through our facility and looking at those things, when the inspector's asking questions, the inspector's looking for admissions. So let's avoid damaging admissions. Um, let's not let compliance officers rifle through documents. And I've got an example of this, the client I told you about that's got $200,000 in citations, that we've got most of them settled, but we've still got six guarding citations we're working on. They let a compliance officer use their conference room to interview employees. And that compliance office, they had safety records uh, and they had things protected by attorney-client privilege that were on a shelf that they turned upside down and even put a stapler on it. I was not their lawyer, and I wasn't there, but I wasn't their lawyer at the time. They hired me um, later. But that compliance officer removed the stapler and went through those records to see if anything was relevant. And there was a, a email that their attorney had sent them about um, not quite interrogating, that's the way OSHA put it, but interrogating the witnesses that OSHA had interviewed to try and get information from them. So you don't let OSHA rifle through. You'll always accompany them. If we'll talk in a minute about employee interviews and we don't have a right to be in there unless the employee insists that we be in there, but don't leave records in the conference room because OSHA may look at those. Um, 
uh, and um, again, prior to this client being my client, they had uh, an OSHA compliance officer insist that they turn on machines that hadn't previously been operated, that they bring somebody over to run those machines so they could observe how they're operated and observe whether there were hazards in the operation of these machines. We have no obligation as an employer to allow that. And a federal court should not order us to do it. And even if a federal court did, any good lawyer would say, we can go in, they'll bring us up for contempt because we're gonna refuse it. And then we'll explain to the federal judge why that's improper and why it should not have been ordered. Now, arguably the lawyer could be put in jail for contempt, not in that situation. You'd just be educating a lawyer that we're not obligated as an owner of this property to operate the machinery while OSHA's there. I mean, if OSHA's there and we're operating it and we've consented to the inspection and they got a search warrant, they could see it. But we don't have to turn stuff on and operate it for OSHA. All right. Um, we talked about the plain sight doctor and anything OSHA sees during its uh, inspection, it can sight. Um, so, and we talked about thinking about the route that you would take to that area for the compliance officer, and we talked about that you could withdraw consent even after you've consented to the OSHA inspection because you don't like how it's going. Uh, we talked about having OSHA put requests in writing. I'd say all requests should be submitted to a single source. IMSHA is awful about this, so if any of you have quarry, anybody that owns a quarry or coal mine in the room, uh, they're regularly by the Mine Safety and Health Administration. They'll go straight to the HR person and ask for records that the general manager has just told them, we're not gonna give you. Um, and if you're not accompanying that IMSHA inspector, uh, they'll do just that. OSHA could do the same thing, so make sure that you've got a single point of contact for all requests for records and that they be in writing. And we should be reviewing whether there is a privilege over those records. Communications with Crane uh, and your insurers are protected by an insurer-insured privilege. Communication with your legal counsel are protected by an insurer-insured privilege. If you're doing self-evaluations or audits of your workplace for compliance with the Occupational Safety and Health Act, there is a self-audit privilege that exists that might preclude OSHA from getting those records. Those are conversations before you turn those over, conversations you ought to have with legal counsel about whether we ought to produce those. Uh, only produce what OSHA requests. Um, it doesn't suit you to give them more than they want. If OSHA asks for the HASCOM program, literally give them the HASCOM program. Don't give them the training records. If OSHA asks for uh, inspection programs of forklifts, just give them that. Don't give them the records of near misses unless they ask for it. Um, we've got no obligation as an employer to create an accident report, but we often do. Um, if we prepare accident reports, if it's an amputation, a hospitalization, or a fatality, I would strongly encourage you to prepare that accident report at the very least with the help of your insurer or broker so we can make an argument for insurer, insured privilege. The best privilege, uh, other than penitent priest, is the attorney-client privilege. And so I would say, if you've got in-house counsel, prepare any accident report at the request of, tell your general counsel, we had an accident, gonna prepare this report, assume you want us to do it, and only give it to you, and who needs to know? Uh, if you don't have in-house counsel, but there's been a fatality, an amputation, or a hospitalization, it's well worth hiring outside counsel to at least say, yeah, let's do an inspection, and let's send that report to me, and even if I were only briefly reviewing it because you had other plans in place, at least we could claim attorney-client privilege. Um, as I said, avoid suggesting that the hazard caused the accident has been a pervasive problem that's been around a while and hadn't been fixed, or stating that the supervisor failed to follow company policy and instructed employees to perform the job a certain way. None of that's good if it has to be turned over to OSHA or to plaintiff's counsel in, in a, a case. Um, never, ever, 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 ever falsify or backdate a document that you're given to OSHA. Um, you guys all seem like wonderful people, but I'm not going to visit you in prison. Um, and you're not going to visit each other in prison. Never falsify or backdate a document. It is, it is not worth it. Not only can the employer be cited, but you can go to jail. Um, so was I abundantly clear on that? Um, on, on an inspection, the call I was talking about that I had while I was watching my son's soccer game, um, which he had a hat trick by, uh, the way. <laughs> they were playing a team that I probably could have had a hat trick against, uh, and I don't even play soccer. Um, but uh, in that particular inspection where it took several weeks for us to negotiate the scope of the inspection, 
we were very cooperative, had a good rapport with the compliance officer. Again, I followed him home one day a year earlier um, just to make sure he got home. Um, but he asked for the lockout tag out program and he had an argument uh, under a target inspection program why he could look at that. So he wanted all of the machine specific procedures. I promise this won't take more than 15 seconds to make sure everybody understands. But if you're performing service on a machine, you have to have, unless, it, unless all of the energy sources for that machine can be eliminated by just unplugging it from the wall and putting that plug in your pocket, you have to have a machine specific procedure that ensures that it can't be inadvertently energized. If it's got pneumatics, hydraulics, even gravity as an energy source, you gotta address each of those procedures. Klein had just opened this plant in April. Klein hadn't yet gotten around to doing all of their machine specific procedures. So we gathered up what records we were gonna make available to OSHA during the inspection. And they told me on the call, they had no machine specific procedures. And I said, all right, well, let's create one for the machine that's at issue in this accident. I said, I don't want you backdating it. Um, we're not gonna lie about it. But I said, when OSHA comes in, we'll save that for the last. And we literally did. Uh, there's a little bit of orchestration in this. Um, I said, we'll save that towards the end. And when he says, I see your lockout tag out program, but I don't see your machine specific procedures. I said, I'll handle that. I said, okay. So when I got there on Monday morning, he had somebody work on the machine specific procedure for this particular piece of equipment. It was ready Monday morning. We took a look at it, looked good. I said, got it. So when we got to that point, he said, I've got your lockout tag out program, but I don't have the machine specific procedure. And I said, well, we're gonna give you one. I said, because this accident was an amputation, uh, unfortunate amputation, but he's gonna, he's gonna be okay and he's gonna still work for this particular client. But I said, this was the only issue that you know, was covered by, I mean, this was the referral um, because they heard it on the police scanner and the client reported the amputation, of course. I said, so we're only gonna give you the machine specific procedure for that. And he said, Lance, I don't like that. I said, I knew you wouldn't. I said, but you know, my client's not obligated to give you machine specific procedures for all of them. I at least convinced them to give you this one to be cooperative and work in good faith. He said, all right, good enough. We didn't have any others. And they got a bunch of machinery in their plant, a bunch. They're working on those, but the point there is I made sure that the client knew we're not gonna backdate this document, we're not gonna represent that it's been around. He's gonna figure out by the date that this was made after the fact, but that's better than having nothing at all. All right, management interviews. Um, statements that managers make, whether they're casual conversations during the inspection, uh, or they're sitting down in a conference room being interviewed, those are binding on the company. Statements that the managers or supervisors make bind the company. So we're able to have a management representative and or an attorney present for any management uh, or supervisor interviews. No witness is required to allow OSHA to record their interviews or to provide written, written statements. Just like we either consent to the inspection or require a search warrant, absent them having a search warrant or our consent, they don't get our videotape um, meetings, uh, interviews, so long as they're instructed no. You're not gonna do that. And I wouldn't like it. I mean, as I said to uh, the AV guy, uh, when my wife was on The Price is Right, literally in 1999, and they panned on the crowd several times, and it showed me in the crowd, my buddy said, if a camera adds 15 pounds, how many cameras were you wearing? <laughs> that was Jenkins who said that, by the way. Uh, I would wanna be interviewed by video um, by a federal regulator, so you just say no. We're not gonna be videotaped. And you're not required to provide a witness statement uh, to sign a witness statement. And so you just tell OSHA, no, we're not gonna do it. But those witnesses, those managers and supervisors should be prepared for that interview as if it is a deposition because they're gonna take copious notes of that and we, again, don't want them saying, yeah, I knew about that for a while, real problem, nobody wanted to fix it, or those sorts of things. All right, employee interviews, employees can have management representative or even have legal representation if they want it, but you gotta talk them into it. But you gotta be careful about talking, it into, talking them into it because they have a right to be interviewed confidentially. So when I do it, I literally say, look, it is up to you whether you wanna be interviewed or not. Typically what'll happen, I'll go back to the forklift example. Appliance officer will say, I wanna talk to two or three of your forklift operators. Okay, we gotta pick who it is. Now, if somebody complained, they might say, I wanna talk specifically to this individual. So I go back and I have a conversation with them. I'm like, look, you don't know me. Here's my business card. I do this for a living. I work for the company. Uh, I'm their lawyer. But I said, OSHA's not gonna tell you what your rights are in this. OSHA's not gonna tell you you don't have to participate in this interview if you don't want to. OSHA's not gonna tell you that they don't, they don't have a right to record this if you don't want it recorded. And I would want it recorded because I wouldn't wanna have my videotape of my interview in a federal regulator's file. Uh, OSHA's not gonna tell you that you could stop this interview if you don't feel 
uncomfortable. They'll tell you, you better be honest, and I'll tell you right now, that is the most important thing. Never, ever, ever lie to OSHA. I said, if you don't feel comfortable with the question, you don't have to answer the question. You can just say, I don't feel comfortable, and I'm not going to say it. If you get, don't like the way the interview's going, you could say you could step out. I said, and if you want me there, if you want to talk to me about the way something's going on in this interview, we can step out of the room or ask the OSHA compliance officer to step out of the room and talk about it, because this is what I do. I said, I'm the company's lawyer, but I'll tell you what your rights are. I'll be honest with you. And I'd say probably seven out of 10 times, they say, yeah, I want to do it. And I'll say, no, you're going to go in that room, and he's, he or she's going to ask me to step out, and he's going to try and talk you out of it. That should be in there. And I, I said, if he's effective, it's your right to be interviewed without me present, and so be it, um, if you'd rather not. I said, but I'll also tell you, if you'd still rather have me in there, if at any point you want to talk to him confidentially, kick me out, because that's your right too. So that's the sort of conversation I have with them, whether it's going to be a management employee that's going to do it, or it's going to be legal counsel. And usually, uh, hopefully I haven't offended anybody terribly today, usually I don't offend them in that fairly brief discussion, and more often than not, they feel comfortable with having me there. Um, and I tell them that I'm going to make sure that when he is making notes, uh, he or she, the compliance officer is making notes of those interviews, it's going to be accurate. And even with the nice guy that I've got a good rapport with, he wrote something down in the wrong place. He wasn't trying to intentionally trick, but the way where it was put on this form would have been bad for my client. And I said, George, that's not right. So we need to cross through that pre-printed question because that answer was a continuation of the earlier one, and it would have looked bad um, for my client. So sorry, I want to make sure that I'm keeping us on track here. Um, recognize, even if you consent to an OSHA inspection, recognize uh, signs when it's going badly. If OSHA starts issuing subpoenas for records as opposed to just verbal and what we would insist upon written document requests, that could be a bad sign. If OSHA wants to take statements under oath, they literally will bring a court reporter to your business or ask you to come to their office um, and want to take statements under oath. I had a client that hired me right about the subpoena moment of an inspection, and the next request was statements under oath. And they were going to get them. Uh, they'd get the statements under oath. But I said, well, we're going to do them at my office because I'm going to want to meet with my client. Um, we don't want you at the facility having shown up with a court reporter, and we're not coming to your offices because you're a government building, and we're going to want a private place to meet. We're going to do it in our offices. They were like, no, we insist it be done in our offices. I'm like, she got a court order. says my client's got to show up at your offices. They're going to be wherever we consent that they'll be, and they're going to be at my office because that's where my client feels comfortable. So we should never went through the sworn statements. Still was an ugly case that fortunately we were able to get resolved, but that's an indication that signs are going bad. If they want to bring in somebody else on the inspection, we talked about the certified industrial hygienist when you asked your question, Rick. Um, but there could be other experts, guardian experts, that they want to bring in. If they're bringing in somebody else, that's a sign it's not going well. Or if a different OSHA investigation team comes in, they have special investigators when they think there are criminal violations. That would be a bad sign. Uh, I've yet to see OSHA bring a lawyer to an inspection, but I know it happens. Another bad sign. Keep that in mind. You might want to withdraw your consent and say, well, continue this on another day, you'll be hearing from us. Talk quickly about closing con conferences. Insist upon a closing conference, because that's when OSHA is going to tell you what they found and what the citations are going to be. They're not going to tell you how much the fines are going to be, and they're not going to necessarily tell you whether they're going to be considered serious citations, uh, which in the grand scheme of things, I won't say they're quite a felony. A repeat and willful are much more like a felony. But serious citations are more than a misdemeanor if we were comparing them to the traffic examples. Um, and they could be upwards of $12,000. And you run the risk that if you have a similar citation in the next five years at that facility or potentially any other facilities similar to that citation, you run the risk that you get a repeat citation or a willful citation where the penalties really get jacked up. I'd ask for a closing concert, conference so you can talk to the OSHA compliance officer about what he or she found and what we could expect um, from uh, those citations. Don't agree to or admit anything during that conference. Yeah, I know we screwed that up. Again, those notes just go back to the OSHA's file and will be used as evidence against us. Um, You'll want to discuss abatement. If you get a citation, OSHA is going to expect that you're going to correct that problem and correct that problem within a certain period of time. Sometimes the corrections OSHA wants just aren't feasible. And sometimes I've had clients who we're going to talk 
because we're still doing okay with 15 minutes to go. We'll talk about your rights after the closing conference. But I had a client who hired me just because it wasn't feasible to abate the citation the way OSHA wanted. And it took me deposing the compliance officer. And really, I did it diplomatically, but making him look like a fool in front of his, in front of his lawyer to get them to realize, yeah, okay, this client can't do that abatement. And this was after we went through the contest proceedings and met with OSHA and explained to them why what OSHA was asking for just wasn't possible. I won't go through the war story, but it would have actually been less safe for our employees if we did what OSHA was saying we had to do. And so we litigated over, essentially, just over the abatement. Um, correct any misunderstandings with OSHA during the closing conference and ask what questions you need, um, but make sure you ask for a closing conference. Uh, don't expect to reach a settlement in the informal conference. OSHA, believe, OSHA knows that the vast majority of employers are going to take the best deal that's on the table at 5 o'clock on the day of the contest. Sort of like buying a car. You go in there and say, I want to buy a car today. You're a sucker. You know, yeah, I'm thinking about getting a car. I'm going to look around at three different places. I'm going to go with the one that gives me the best deal. Not in any hurry. My car's doing fine. It's the same way with the OSHA informal conference, but they know so many employers will just say, I don't want to incur the legal expense, or this must be right, this is the federal government, because every time the federal government does something, it's right, so they must have me uh, dead to rights on this. Um, don't walk into there expecting that you're going to reach a settlement. And it's good if you're going to go to an informal conference to talk with somebody who does these regularly, whether it's legal counsel or a loss control specialist, about what to expect and what the implications would be. Don't go in there with the mindset that you're going to get a deal done, because otherwise you're going to get a deal done that's not going to be particularly favorable to you. Fortunately, OSHA has stopped, uh, under this administration, stopped shaming employers, or at least shaming employers as frequently with press releases. Um, but that is the, a real possibility. And when there's a fatality, unfortunately, OSHA tells that family up front in its inspection that we're going to get justice for you, we're going to do right. And they'll force themselves, essentially, to issue citations oftentimes because they want to be able to say to that family, look, we issued citations to this employer. And they put a press release uh, up on that. Um, if you get citations, it's got to include a description of the alleged vi violation. It's got to reference the regulation that's cited. You'll get a classification, serious, willful, repeated, or other than serious. They have to issue them within 180 days. I'm going to move quickly. Uh, other than serious, as I said, that's a violation of the act, but it's not one where there's a substantial probability of death or serious, bi serious bodily injury. So oftentimes record keeping, but not exclusive. Um, it's going to be a serious citation if there's a reasonable probability that death or serious bodily injury could result and a broken arm to OSHA is serious bodily injury. So if they think it's reasonably probable that somebody could even break their arm, it will be serious, but they might back off of that. Maximum penny, penalty, almost 13 grand. Um, willful is typically when you've had multiple similar violations and you're still not cleaning up your act. I said repeat would, you, would be when you have a substantially similar violation within five years. Maximum penalty is 126000 under um, when they went up um, under the prior administration. We did talk just briefly about criminal charges, and all these could be evidence of punitive damages in civil cases. The Occupational Safety and Health Act is not a strict liability statute. The Mine Safety and Health Act is. OSHA has to be able to prove, and that's important. Uh, it is OSHA's burden of proof. OSHA has to be able to prove in a court of law with the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission, which we'll go through quickly, but they have to be able to prove that we as an employer knew or we as an employer should have known that this was a hazard and we didn't correct it. That is OSHA's burden of proof. Um, and it gets worse uh, if they can prove that we knew about it and that we didn't do anything about it. So that's why I said be careful about the admissions that we make. Um, we, if we're negotiating with, with OSHA over uh, something that we're sort of dead to rights to, I mean, a good defense is it really hadn't happened for that long. We hadn't had an opportunity to detect it. Um, you know, employees are trained to avoid those sorts of hazards. Um, we inspect our workplace regularly, and we just hadn't caught it this time. Those are the sort of things that you would argue why your negligence should be less. There's also an employee misconduct defense that we as an employer can cite when we have a rule in place that would prohibit what was being done, that we've 
adequately communicated that rule to our employees through training, that we regularly supervise our employees to ensure that they comply with that and the other rules, and that in this instance, this employee didn't do it. And here's some evidence of other incidents when employees didn't do it. And when it happened the second or third time, we fired them. Um, but this employee cleaned up their act, and you can point to records of how we've enforced those rules. I know I'm leading uh, or going through this um, quickly to make sure I don't keep you over. Um, we've talked, uh, yeah, we've talked enough about um, employer rights and employee rights. Um, government, back to your question, Rick, or your point, you know, is it all going to be done in one day? Government could call employees at home. Um, government could ask, the compliance officer could ask questions during their visits and, the, and they're walking around. Even in the hallway, it might seem like it's informal. Um, but it's not. And they'll say, you're not the target, or if you have nothing to hide, why would you be worried about sharing that program with me? Uh, because you don't have a right to it, and you have policing authority, so I don't have anything to hide, but that's outside the scope of the inspection. Um, you have 15, work as employers, we have 15 working days from receiving a citation, from receipt in hand, to file a notice of contest with the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission. By and large, if it's not Labor Day or Fourth of July, that means you have exactly three weeks to contest your citation. So if you want to get a deal done with OSHA before you're negotiating with their lawyer, and likely your legal counsel is negotiating with their lawyer, you've got to do it in that three-week window of time. You cannot get an extension on that contest deadline. If you do not file your notice of contest with the OSHA area office, by the 15th working day, it becomes a final and binding order of the commission, and you'll get a notice from the DOL that you've got to pay the penalties. So um, in some instances, I'll tell clients when it's going to be a waste of their money to pay me to go to an informal conference, because I'll know particular area directors, and I'll know that they're not going to reach the sort of deal that they'll want. And I'll say, save your money on this end, because this case is going to be assigned to a lawyer out of Kansas City, whom I will likely know, or out of Chicago, I've got a decent chance of knowing, but some of my other 30 colleagues might know because they're in our Chicago office and deal with them regularly. And I'll say that lawyer can be persuaded, and that lawyer could persuade this area director. We're in St. Louis. I think Bill McDonald's a really good guy. I think the assistant area directors that I met with are good guys, and I'd say, let's do it. Um, I've got other area offices that I won't name, since, I'm not, since I'll be diplomatic, where I'd say, it might be a waste of your time. Some clients still want to do it. I always say the best clients are the ones that don't take my advice and pay their bills on time, and that's fine, <laughs> if that's what they want to do. <laughs> and sometimes I said, well, at least we can explain to them why when they later hear it from their lawyer that they ought to be thinking about this. So if you want to do it, that's fine. Just don't go in thinking you're going to get a deal, <laughs> because it's not going to be a deal that's necessarily going to be acceptable to you. And I'm saying that after I've talked through with them the risks and finding out what their risk tolerance is and what it is they're looking for. I'm not suggesting I'm telling the clients what they've got to do. I realize I work for you guys when I'm helping you. I'm going to help them make an assessment and then make an assessment whether it makes sense to go through the informal conference. But in most cases, it does. All right. So administrative con contest, yes, you will uh, end up um, if you file a contest, you're going to end up incurring attorney's fees for having to do that. But there are many reasons why it might make sense. Again, OSHA thinks that most employers, because they do, will take the best deal that's on the table at 5 o'clock on the contest deadline. And the best deal they might offer is 30% or 50% reduction on the penalties. Or they might say, well, we'll change this one other than serious, but these other five, they're going to stay as serious. And there are reasons why. I had this happen literally two weeks ago. A client who's got 4,400 retail stores nationwide gets two citations, and they email that morning and say, we're just trying to provide our abatement documentation to OSHA to tell them we've fixed this. Their contest deadline was going to be in about five days. But they were giving me pictures of the hazard and saying, we're going to fix this. Uh, it was just, I mean, it's a retail store. They had boxes piled up in front of the exit. I, and um, they're a video game store. I said, you've got young people working for you who are going to pile up boxes at all of your other 4,399 4, stores. You're going to accept a serious citation when you know, I didn't call them knuckleheads, but I've talked to some at other stores, um, that these people are going to do this. And you're going to run the risk of a repeat when this happens in Waltham, New Jersey, 
because you accepted the citation in St. Joe, Missouri. I said, do you really want to do that? I said, I think we can get OSHA to reduce this to no other than series, which is of critical importance because OSHA almost certainly will never issue a repeat citation based upon a prior other than serious citation. Now they changed their policies under the prior administration that says they can. But invariably, OSHA only bases a repeat citation where the fine doubles, or willful, where the fine go up to 126,000. If there was a prior serious citation in the last five years, and under the prior administration, and could happen under this administration too, they won't just limit it to your plant in St. Louis, but might look at what your plant in Kansas City had for OSHA citations and base a repeat on your plant here in St. Louis. So it's of critical importance, I said to this client, my recommendation, would be that we get this reduced to other than series because you're going to have this happen again. Um, and they took my advice. Now, we didn't get, it's aggressive area director. We did an informal conference. We established a really good rapport. And he said he wasn't going to change that to other than series. I said, I appreciate it. I mean, he said, I don't have authority to do that. That's BS, but that's neither here nor there. So I appreciate it. I said, but my client's going to contest it. So we'll get a chance to talk again. So I emailed the notice of contest, said, looking forward to working with you to try and get a resolution of this. But we're not going to accept a serious citation. And they shouldn't have. They were empty boxes. Somebody could step over them. In the unlikely event that there was a shooter in this one store or there was a fire and they had to get out of the store, they can crush the boxes. I know. I crush them every Sunday night. I said, this is not death or serious bodily injury. Shouldn't have happened, but it's not a serious citation. And they shouldn't have $19,000 worth of penalties because of empty boxes there and empty boxes in front of an electrical panel that wasn't fully closed. But there are reasons why you might not want to accept that best deal at 5 o'clock uh, on the day of the contest deadline. Now, I've only got about four more minutes here, and I don't want you running me out with pitchforks. Um, but we talked some about records and your rights with regard to records. These, uh, you've got these slides. I'm going to skip crisis management, not because it's not important. I mean, if you have a fatality or a catastrophe, OSHA's going to issue press releases. You've got bigger issues. I know you'll be hiring legal counsel, and we'd probably be talking about if you don't have press relations, what firm you might want to hire for your press on that. But I'm going to, at the interest of time, um, uh, if there's not a reasonable, if an employee makes a complaint to OSHA and OSHA, it doesn't fall under one of their emphasis programs and there's not a substantial likelihood of death or serious bodily injury, what you likely get from OSHA is a fax or email complaint, an informal complaint asking you uh, about the problem. Fact of the matter is, even if the employee's right and you said, yeah, we screwed this up, but here's how we're going to fix it, you're not likely ever going to see OSHA. Um, I'm not saying that ought to be your first defense. If there's no problem at all, that's what you ought to tell them. But um, through the informal complaint process, you could potentially convince OSHA to back down by complying with those deadlines. I'll tell you, if you ignore that complaint and don't respond to OSHA within seven days, you are almost certainly going to have an OSHA inspector come out to your facility. So back to that prior slide. Uh, make sure you get it to legal, post the complaint, get it to legal, investigate and respond within seven days or ask for an extension and respond. So we've talked about this, I've talked about these contest proceedings. There is a federal agency that is only affiliated with OSHA in the sense that they only resolve disputes under the Occupational Safety and Health Act called the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission and they are independent judges. I think it was your point, Rick, that maybe they're not as independent because maybe they're more left-leaning or more right-leaning depending upon when they were appointed. But their job is to be an arbiter of whether OSHA meets its burden of proof or if it's an affirmative defense like employee misconduct or infeasibility because we can't make the changes OSHA wants us to make, that they are an independent third party to resolve that dispute. That is how these citations are tried. OSHA knows that even if they say give you a bad deal um, and expect that most employers are going to take it and you file your contest. Case is going to get assigned to a lawyer. That case is going to get assigned to a judge. OSHA knows that there's going to be settlement discussions beyond that contest deadline. In certain instances, you're going to need to exercise your right to file that contest because you may not be able to get a deal from OSHA that you'd expect. And in big cases, like the one I told you about, they'll assign one of these judges to do a settlement conference so you can early on potentially reach a settlement and reduce your legal spend. And I've been in one of those settlement conferences for two months with the judge in the middle on the bottom there, Judge Augustine. Uh, there are bench trials, there's no juries, less formal evidentiary rules, there are pleadings that OSHA has to file. There is beyond that, um, if you're unhappy with the result you get from your administrative law judge, there's a review commission that could consider it. 
It could go to the U.S. Court of Appeals, so it's very rare, of course. Um, or you could even take it to the um, U.S. Supreme Court, um, which I had the good fortune of being in front of in January of 2015. Didn't get a chance much to talk about the whistleblower protection, but you may know that there are 11C complaints employees can make under the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission, and there are discrimination <laughs> investigators that we get assigned to those. Um, it is incredibly rare that the federal government would file suit against an employer for a whistleblower complaint under the Occupational Safety and Health Act or even any of the other 20 some odd safety statutes that OSHA has jurisdiction to investigate. Much more likely that they would hire a lawyer and pursue a common law discharge claim. Um, the record keeping rule. Um, sorry, I, I've, I know I'm over, but I'll confine this to one minute or two minutes. You knew all the buzz about OSHA um, saying that um, drug testing employees would be retaliation, that when employees report injuries and you insist that they drug test, that that is retaliation to drug test them. You also know, I'm sure, that under the prior administration they were talking about these safety incentive programs also being retaliatory because they would chill employees from making complaints about injuries because then people don't get the pizza party or the $25 safety bonus because there was an injury. All of that stuff, all of that meat, the drug testing meat and the safety incentive was all in a preamble to OSHA's new um, retaliation rule that it put into place. By a preamble, it raises the question about whether this administration is going to allow the Occupational Safety and Health Administration to even enforce that, because it's not a rule, it's just the discussion um, that led to a more general rule. That said, it would be prudent for us as employers to not just drug test people that have accidents, but drug test anybody who contributed to that accident. Now, in many instances, that might just be the forklift driver. But if the forklift driver was being distracted by the couple of yahoos that were engaging in horseplay, send them all for a drug test, and that's how you'll avoid a retaliation claim. If somebody gets injured because of a crane, and the crane operator was operating the crane, but you're just going to test the iron worker that was down below who was doing the work, test them both. Um, because only the iron worker got injured, not the crane operator. And you could say, look, they were both potentially at fault, so we tested both. That's how you avoid those retaliation claims. Similarly, uh, but again, it remains to be seen whether under this administration OSHA is going to enforce that, but undoubtedly some discrimination investigators are going to take issue with it. And I had a pretty expensive 11C discrimination investigation for a large government contractor um, because um, after somebody injured themselves, they had this person wear not a hard hat, a bump cap, so they wouldn't have another head injury, and they thought they were really just trying to single out this employee, and so they did dig into it. Um, so there is a chance that OSHA could try and enforce this with drug testing, uh, or any conduct that would look like it's designed to prevent or chill people from making complaints of work related injuries. So that's, but that's a good way around it with the drug testing. With the safety incentive um, policies, um, don't make the reward too big. Uh, and ideally, don't make it based upon reportable injuries. Because if you're making it on reportable injuries, it's by definition retaliatory. Because you're saying, if we've got to put this in our injury and illness logs, which we're legally required to do, we're going to take the incentive away from you or the group. Um, make it based upon near misses, or include near misses. Say it's reportable injuries, unreportable injuries, near misses, or just dumb, dumb, dumb things that people do. And that's when we're going to take it away. And if they enforce it, that's the way um, that you can work your way around that. <sighs> How's that? Any questions? <laughs> Sorry, I know we covered a lot there and maybe left a little bit on the table. Uh, I'm happy to stick around, so if you've got any questions, happy to help. And now you all uh, are stuck with my contact info. So uh, if you want any of those updates uh, or invitations to our breakfast briefings, our workplace safety seminar, just shoot me an email, tell me what you want, and happy to help. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much.